Zane Hodges, and if you don't familiar with Zane Hodges, he's um he's d deceased. He went on to be with the Lord, but he was part of Grace Evangelical Society, uh, also known as GES. Um, he's a prominent uh, teacher there. So Zane Hodges says that entering God's rest, mentioned in Hebrews 4, is not actually about salvation or faith alone, but it is actually a special type of reward in heaven. What do you say? Hey, Renee. Are you ready with an answer? Sorry, I was typing a answer to someone in the chat. Give me just a second. Mm -hmm. Yes, so I want to pull up. It's Hebrews 4, right? Hebrews yes, 4. yes. I think the context here is an Old Testament's reference to rest that Israel had, isn't it? Hold on, let me see. I believe resting in Christ is about the gospel, but let me let me pull up the section here. All right, Hebrews chapter four. Let us therefore fear a promise left of us entering into his rest. Yeah, well, one we we know Hebrews. The context of Hebrews is that the law had a shadow of good things to come, right? But the law could never take away sins. Uh, and then it tells us, but this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down the right hand of God, encouraged our sins, were perfected forever, right? But these Hebrew people, some of them were still putting trust in the Levitical law, the temple system. This is during the second temple period, Herod's rebuilt temple. And uh, they, I think they were confused on, well, do we still continue in these traditions and the Levitical animal sacrifices? And that's addressed here. Uh, I, I think though this is about them having a, a temporal peace of mind and temporal growth because it says, let us not lay again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith towards God. And it lists all these things like washing of hands, laying on of hands, baptisms and stuff like that, right? So I think this is about moving on to growth and perfection in the faith rather than being held back because we don't believe God's promises. And so when it says, let us therefore fear less, a promise being left us of entering into his rest any of you should seem to come short of it. And I think coming short there is not having the full assurance of faith that he says to have, that God wants us to come boldly to the throne of grace, having a heart in full assurance of faith. Um, so we'll read a little more. For unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them. But the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith and them that heard it. For we which have believed do enter into rest. As he said, I have sworn in my wrath that they shall enter into my rest, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. And he's showing how the Sabbath is a shadow of the rest we have in Christ. And he spake in a certain place of the seventh day on this wise. And God did rest the seventh day from all his works. And in this place again, if they shall enter into my rest, seeing therefore it remaineth that some must enter therein and they to whom it was first preached enter not in because of unbelief so there's two things here it could be literal salvation you you until you believe the gospel you can't rest in christ right but here i believe it's speaking to the hebrew people that were believers about not entering into the mental rest uh and growing on to perfection in Christ. Um, but he mentions here, if you want to take it to the salvific place, that seeing therefore it remains that some must enter therein and they to whom it was first preached enter not in because of unbelief. So until they believe they can never rest in Christ, they're constantly working towards something they can never achieve. They need to rest in Christ to achieve it. But I believe here, 
that this is an overall rest for their weary souls, knowing it's finished. Because here it says, again, he was pointing to the Sabbath day as a picture of the rest we have in Christ, right? And he limiteth a certain day, saying in David, today, after so long a time, as it said, today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts. For if Jesus had given them rest, then would he not afterward have spoken of another day? There remaineth therefore a rest to the people of God. For he that is entered into his rest, he has also ceased from his own works as God did from his. Let us labor, therefore, to enter into that rest, lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. So it's a warning to the Hebrew believers. Don't uh, go. Don't put your faith back into the temporal uh, temple system, but let it remain in Christ. Rest in what he has done, knowing it's been finished for you uh, so that you don't uh, miss out on any of the promises that come with it. I, I believe that is the context of it. Mm -hmm. Okay, all right, Ben. Well, um, I know that there's a lot of people that think that that uh, kind of see that um, that rest in Hebrews is a picture of entering into eternal life. Uh, and so they, they take the, the again, the entering the promised land in the Old Testament as a picture of that Whereas I think it's much more applicable to see their, their uh, exodus from Egypt as a picture of salvation because that's when they were freed from the law. That, that's when they, they escaped the law. Um, and it was all done through God's grace. Uh, so, uh, in fact, it, so in the, the, again, in the Old Testament, they, there was really nothing up to, that, uh, nothing up to them whatsoever. Uh, all they did was uh, the, God sent them to deliver Moses and most did miracle after miracle to, to uh, deliver them. And uh, it was a mercy and grace upon grace. Um, and yet they, they continued to uh, rebel against it. You, and actually, it, and through that episode, it, there's a number of verses that say they believed. They believed, they believed Moses and they believed God. So um, I don't believe entering the rest in Hebrews or in the promised land is a picture of eternal salvation. I think what's a picture of it's it's very broad in Hebrews. I believe personally, it's a picture of entering that rest on a daily basis, like you know, entering the faith rest life. So continuing, just like we talked about in Colossians, about continuing to abide and continue in the faith and not drawing back to the law. So in that sense, it's it's entering his rest on a daily basis through faith, which allows you to grow. But also has, I think, it also has an idea of. Uh, eternal rewards, because I think essentially, again, I, I've considered every paradigm you can apply to Hebrews. You know, I could, you can take it back to, okay, some people were believers, some weren't, some people were on the fence, some weren't. But I think the only paradigm that works that resolves all conflicts, and yes, there are some things that that are um, contra contrary to how we naturally think, but again, if you if it, it, it is consistent with the way the, the Bible speaks, and that is, um, there's no guarantee that any believers can continue to believe forever, and they could draw back. Uh, and so I believe Hebrews is written to all born-again believers, uh, all the people who are, who are addressed, we're believers, and it's a warning to them and an admonition to them to continue to believe and continue to grow. And that's why you see things like, um, you know, him emphasizing the, that Christ is better than the law, the old covenant is, the new covenant is better than the new covenant. And not to be like Esau, who was short-sighted and could only live for the here and now, but be like Jacob, who in Abraham, who through patience inherited the promises. Uh, and again, it's not a promise of eternal life. It's a pr promise of eternal reward. And uh, again, it's all about your birthright, essentially, because they were born again uh, and they had a birthright, but they could forsake their birthright just like Esau did. They could, you know, not, they could... Uh, be only concerned about the here and now, like Esau was, and go back to um, uh, feeding his flesh, essentially. Uh, where, where again, Jacob, Jacob was concerned about the long, the long view. Uh, he was concerned about his birthright. He, he, in fact, he was so concerned about it uh, that he cheated his brother out of it. And so, again, Esau didn't be, cease to become a son because his birthrights were forsaken. He just lost his reward. He lost his. Uh, he was short-sighted, and he, and he gave up uh, 
you know, because he was short-sighted. And again, he she was short-sighted because he wanted to go back and eat, quote-unquote, the red stuff. And again, they get the picture, which is, uh, in the Old Testament, it's a picture of uh, soup or food, but I think it's also a picture of blood. You know, he was bloodthirsty, essentially. He was a hunter. Um, and so don't be like an animal like Esau, you know, hairy and red and bloodthirsty and hunting. Uh, be like Jacob, uh, you know, self-controlled, thinking of the long things, things of the spirit. Um, and so, you know, not, not putting your, um, hope and investment in, into this life, but into the next life. And that's why, again, I, I think that's a common theme all through, uh, Hebrews. And so when it says, um, you know, th that's why it says like, and there's actually very puzzling things too. Cause like there, and this is a verse that says, for example, but we are not like the, uh, paraphrasing, but we are not like those who draw back per to perdition, but we are those who believe and um and uh press on to salvation of the soul or something to that effect and again and then but then he later exhorts these same people to continue to believe and don't draw back so when it says we are not like those who draw back that's a positional statement he's basically saying hey you're a believer you believed at one point in time and again i know it sounds strange but that you see this pattern all through scripture where paul who some people even believe he uh, was written by uh hebrews were written by paul Paul makes his exhortations all the time based on positional truths. Because you are this, because you've already achieved this, now live your life out accordingly. And I believe that's what with, with that verse in Hebrews where it says, we are uh, we are not those who draw back, but we are those who, who believe and, and uh, press on to the salvation of the soul. He's saying, because you believe in the past, you're not, don't be like those who, who, who don't believe. You could, you could, because you actually are in real danger of, Becoming dull of hearing, uh, being need to be retaught the basic uh, principles of Christ again. You know, uh, baptisms, laying out of hands, etc. They become dull of hearing. Uh, they become like Esau. That was a really da a real danger for them. And he was telling them, "No, you need to press on to maturity. Uh, it's, it's nothing to do with the eternal salvation. It's all about to do with your birthright, and your birthright is eternal reward. And also, um, again." Uh, the eternal, only way you can you can invest in that eternal reward is to, on a day by day, moment by moment basis, continue to walk uh, by faith and not by drawing back into unbelief, uh, in back into the law and trying to do the works of the law to be justified and to have a right relationship with God. Um, there's so much to unpack in Hebrews, and I'm looking forward to when we can um, uh, do it verse by verse. But um, you know, there's there's no way to do this question justice uh, on this you know, tonight, but um, that's a little taste of where I, I personally stand on the issue. All right. Um, well, you know, I, I was commending uh, earlier uh, both of you for uh, going, talking about the context, but see, context for a verse is, it is not only uh, the preceding verses, and the, the following verses, uh, it's much broader than that. Really, we have to look at the context of the, a lot of verses around it, but then we need to also keep in mind what's the context of the, the book, the epistle itself, and how does that fit in the total context of the, the, of the, the Bible? Uh, so I think all those things have to be uh, at the forefront before we attempt to even uh, talk about a verse. And with that in mind, I would say that uh, I think that the context of the book of Hebrews is uh, I think that Paul wrote it. Now, uh, I, I would say that probably a, about maybe half the people I encounter uh, agree that Paul wrote it, but many other think that it was Apollos or who knows, somebody else, but not Paul. But um, one of the reasons I think Paul wrote it is I, I see it as a sequel to uh, Galatians. Um, it, it's this, the same point is really being made. And, and, and that is that um, you've got to um, leave Judaism behind. The, the, the church in the beginning, um, the, the, there were two mistakes early on in the church. As a matter of fact, this lasted all the way through probably the entire uh, 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 record of, of, of the book of Acts, uh, it, it, which encompasses about a 30-year span. Uh, so from the from the, the 
ascension of Jesus and Pentecost all, all the way to the very end of, end of Acts. But uh, the, the purpose, what was going on in the church in the beginning was that they initially didn't realize that uh, Gentiles would be included. Uh, so I mentioned earlier how, well, this was first devoted to Peter, and then Peter had to take a stand against James and the Jerusalem church that, hey, God told me himself that Gentiles are not unclean anymore. And so he shared the gospel, and you had got the first Gentile believers, uh, uh, and that happened 10 years after Pentecost. That, that Cornelius', Cornelius con conversion was 10 years after Pentecost. So for the first 10 years, there were no Gentile believers. And then once they realized, okay, Gentiles can be also be part of this, they didn't realize that uh, uh, the Gentiles, uh, and, and for that matter, the Jews themselves, uh, you cannot mix Judaism with faith in Jesus. See, the Jews were still practicing Judaism. It really, Christianity was initially considered a sect of Judaism. Just like we have denominations of Christianity, initially it was called the way, and it was just a, um, a, a, and a little slightly different version of Judaism. Uh, so they continued doing all the things of Judaism, and that's why in Galatians, Paul is confronting them over uh, insisting that you be circumcised. What's circumcision? That's an initiation, right, into Judaism. Uh, so he says, you don't impose circumcision on the Gentiles. Don't impose uh, Sabbath keeping. Don't impose the, all the laws of Moses. And, and it's faith alone, and you need to leave Judaism out of it. You can't mix it. And that same point is being made in Hebrews, except now he's addressing the other problem, that they're not only doing those things, but they're even going to the temple to worship, and they're uh, doing bringing their animals and sacrificing. So what they're doing, they're still practicing all of the, the religion of, of Judaism, and in addition, now they believe Jesus is the promised Messiah. So uh, this idea of resting uh, is, uh, look, you're you're still working. You're still doing religion. You're, you know, forget about that. You need to rest and realize that Jesus finished it all. Uh, it, it, circumcision, all these uh, laws of Moses and now animal sacrifices, you've got to separate yourself from that. So the, the second problem in the beginnings of the church was that they didn't realize that Judaism has to be left behind and has to be discarded. Not only does Paul tell them, don't impose Judaism on uh, uh, the Gentiles, but even Peter was stopped practicing Judaism until the, Ju the men from, from G uh, James came and uh, he wouldn't eat with the Gentiles, a regular Gentile food. He, he went and ate with the, the men from James and ate the J Jewish food because he didn't want a conflict uh, with them. Uh, but he wasn't practicing Judaism anymore. Paul, Paul wasn't practicing Judaism. And Paul says he's the, great, the, the biggest Jew of them all. And yet he wouldn't practice Judaism. So the point is that not only can, should you not impose Judaism, and they're still doing it today. They're trying to impose Judaism on, on the church today with all the religious things that, you know, like the commandments, the commandments, of, of Ten Commandments. This was never given to the, the whole world. That was given to Israel only. So when we, um, it, it's the problem happened at the beginning of the church. It's never really left imposing Judaism or various religious uh, duties. Uh, to the church, but now we need to rest. If a person is not resting in Jesus alone, that means they either didn't understand the gospel initially, or they're like some of the people in Hebrews and some of the people in Galatians that they believed, and yet because of pressure from the Judaizers, or in Hebrews, it's pressure from family members and and their peers saying, "Oh, come on, you got to, you can't, you got to keep going to the temple." And, and, and so they didn't want to lose their standing with their family as far as there were people who were being shunned by family members because they wouldn't go to the temple anymore. So they, they gave in and they compromised and they went to the temple and they did their animal sacrifices rather than just resting in the finished work of Christ.